1970, population declined by 17%. You can see a little bump here in the chart um, where they annexed <laughs> a bunch of land, so their population actually went up when they annexed in some populated areas. Uh, but then the, they started to decline again even after that. So they lost another 10% of the population during the 1980s. Um, during the 1980s, they also lost 28% in uh, manufacturing employment. And in 1969, they had the dubious honor of having the dirtiest air in the country. So um, Chattanooga is a really good example of economic revitalization through investing in the poor. And it's also a very good example of partnerships, about bringing in a lot of different actors into making changes. So beginning in the, um, in the 1980s, public and private investments were made in the downtown. So this was the city, this was uh, private foundations, and a lot of partners that actually made incremental investments in different projects in the downtown in the waterfront, in parks, in school, and in uh, some major, actually, local attractions, an aquarium, a stadium. And the outcomes have been significant. They have um, had residential population gains, and they've also diversified their economic base. So instead of being a primarily manufacturing economy, they now have finance, insurance, higher ed, and tourism as some uh, prime employers. So we have some other examples of this type of incremental improvements that can be made. We went through um, Delray Beach last night and took some photos of some of the investments that they're making um, focused on the, the Arts District, Pineapple Grove, but, a, but we heard that a lot of communities in Florida have done made similar efforts, Pompano Beach, West Palm, Stewart. Um, and those types of incremental improvements include code enforcement. My understanding is that was a significant part of the effort in Delray Beach. Increased police presence in the downtown, parcel assembly, uh, making small loans and grants to small businesses, subsidizing improvements to existing buildings just so the downtown looks a little nicer and then also making uh, public investments in sidewalks, streetscape, arts, and community-based improvements. We call this type of um, improvements in this bottom bullet place making. And so these are the kinds of things that make a place feel really nice, that sidewalks make it feel like a community that you can walk around and hang around in public spaces that are enjoyable to be in. Uh, these are other economic benefits of smart growth. So we've gone through some of the, again, uh, the fiscal and economic benefits that may accrue to the city or that are on a more municipal scale, but these are those that accrue to the wider community. Uh, again, increased physical activity. If you have a walkable neighborhood, people will get out and walk. So increased physical activity which then results in reduced public health costs, reduced congestion, transportation costs, and it has been shown that reduced congestion and transportation costs actually increases productivity. People show up to work on time and are able to, to, to be more productive because they are not stuck in traffic. Uh, it, it improves access to jobs and education for the residents and it can reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. And then these examples here are actually from, uh, well this one on the left is from Portland, and it shows that people who live in urban environments walk more and drive less, which may seem obvious, but the numbers are pretty significant. In the least urban places, people spend, excuse me, um, 70 minutes in a car, and very little, it looks like less than five minutes walking. In the most urban places, they spend less than 40 minutes in a car and about 10 minutes walking. So actually the overall transportation time can be less in those cases. 
So how to do this? How to grow smarter to improve fiscal and economic health? Uh, one tool that cities use is to look at fiscal impact as one component of land use planning. So when you're considering how to develop or, or trying to evaluate potential projects, looking at the fiscal, the projected fiscal impacts of those projects. So this example is from Champaign, uh, Illinois, and as part of their 2011 comprehensive plan process, they did a very comprehensive impact analysis. First, looking at development scenarios, looking at uh, the location of potential growth, where and how should we grow, and then looking at the cost of land use. So how different types of land use contribute to uh, fiscal impacts. And they found that location matters. So when they looked at where growth was proposed, could be proposed for, um, to occur, uh, this chart on the right shows the annual average net fiscal impact by projected growth. So anything that's pointing down is negative and anything that's pointing up is positive. The, uh, the most positive area, the area that they found that growth would have a net positive impact on the municipal finances is this area in the middle, which is their infill development area. And most of the other areas were found to have a net negative fiscal impact. And a lot of this was driven by infrastructure costs because they had to extend their, the sewer and other infrastructure out to these outlying areas. Over time, it was shown that those areas would typically have a negative impact. They also found that not all land uses, not all types of growth pay for themselves. So this is a separate, a second analysis that they did, a cost of land use analysis, where they estimated the annual net fiscal impact of different types of residential land uses and non-residential land uses. So here on the left, we have uh, the annual net result for residential prototypes. And I bet these words are pretty small, but over, um, again, the middle line on this left chart is zero, and anything that's pointing up is a net positive impact, and anything pointing down is negative. The only two types of residential development that they found had a net positive fiscal impact, or what people might say, pay for themselves. The revenues that are generated by that land use cover the cost, and then maybe a little bit more. They had two types of residential development that did that. One is single family detached high price point. So basically luxury single family homes. And the other type is downtown apartments. So single family detached medium price point, single family detached low price point, and then apartments that actually occurred on the front were all a net negative fiscal impact for Champaign. On the other chart, it shows the, the similar impacts for non-residential land uses. So here we have office, retail big box, retail neighborhood, industrial, and healthcare clinic are these examples. And for <coughs> non-residential land uses, they found that the only two types that have a net positive fiscal impact were the retail, and that is um, the bigger block is actually retail big box, and that uh, medium-sized block is, is neighborhood retail. Can you, can you so, go, I mean, what is this? This. Can you, can you say again on the left-hand side there, the two places that are above the